Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of 50 Shades of Over 50. Now, as you know, typically on this show, I have females. I've only had one other male. That was my husband. <laughs> but today we have another male on the show, and I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Chris Raynor. He is an orthopedic surgeon. He's also um, a content creator. He is the founder of Human 2.0, a movement that he founded. And I'd love to welcome you to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I greatly appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk about, you know, whatever we're going to talk about, all things health, health related. So, yes. Thank you. Yes. So the first question I have for you is, how old are you? Uh, I'm 50. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm 52. 52. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I last checked, that's how. When you that's last how checked, it that's right. Okay, great. I try so, not to pay too much attention to that, though. Yeah, it's just a number. You know, we don't pay attention to that. We just kind of keep on going. So great. So you're 52. So great. So you're well equipped to answer the questions that we have because you're most of my audience are typically 50, 60, 70, and over. Yeah. So one of the questions I do want to bring ask you is, when it comes to like knee replacement surgery, which you know, women at this age in their 60s and 70s tend to go for. What are some of the things that we can do to kind of prevent that or maybe even push it as far ahead as we can? Mm -hmm. Well, so there's there are a lot of things um, that uh, that people can do to, to prevent these things. Um, and, and they range from uh, sort of the, the regular things that people think about, which are diet and all, and those kinds of things, um, yeah. to, to exercise programs and, and that kind of stuff. So if, let, if we go right from the top and we, and we yes. talk about sort of, um, uh, broad, uh, stroke kind of things. So we always talk about, talk to people about being as active as possible. Mm. And, and it's funny because, um, oftentimes people think that, you know, arthritis is a wear and tear problem, mm -hmm. but it's, that's not really the case. It's more, oh, of really? it's more of a metabolic issue. Mm. And, and there are cer certainly if you have um, some, you know, joint pathology because you've had an injury or an accident or something like that, then in those circumstances, there is some element of wear and tear, but it, it's largely um, a biologic process that occurs in some people. We don't don't exactly know why, okay. um, and and so um, despite that, we still want people to be active, yeah. and and not only that, but studies show us that for people who do have arthritis, if you compare um, people who have arth, if you take all the people who have arthritis and you um, split them into two groups, people who exercise and people who do not exercise, mm -hmm. even though they all have arthritis, the people who don't exercise are going to fare worse. They're going to have a mm. poor range of motion. They're going to have more pain and reduced function. So mm. even in the, even in the face of arthritis, it still is good for people to be, um, to, to, uh, be active and exercise. So, so number one, we yeah. want people to be active and, and exercise as much as possible. And the exercise should be, um, uh, the, the exercise should be of a nature where we're, we're not trying to, um, you know, necessarily make people jacked or, or we're not trying to, you know, yeah. make them look a particular way. We just want them to um, spend time working on flexibility. We want them to mm. spend time on developing lean muscle mass. And mm -hmm. we want them to um, work on functional movements, things that they see and do uh, throughout the day. And, and so th those are the types of activities that we want people to be engaged in. Um, also, um, and this is kind of a, a no brainer, um, but we want people to maintain a healthy, uh, healthy weight. Okay. And I'm not talking necessarily about, uh, a particular body habitus or a particular mm -hmm. size. I say this to all my patients who have arthritis. It doesn't matter whether you're 300 pounds or even if, whether you're 100 pounds, um, if you have arthritis or if you are, if we're talking about, um, the amount of force that is uh, being applied to the joint surface, to the cartilage mm. of the joint, less is better, right? Okay. So if you are a hundred, and I'm not trying to make skinny people like, you know, rail thin, I'm not trying to do that. All I'm saying is that from a purely, sci purely science perspective, mm. right? Yeah. 
95 pounds is less than 100 pounds. Yeah. 145 pounds is less than 50. And 285 pounds is less than 300. So um, whatever weight you are, if you can reduce that weight or try to um, maintain a lower weight, that is also going to be more friendly to the joint. Um, in terms of, so that's number two. In yeah. terms of uh, number three, we, I think it's important for people to be, um, to recognize that, that um, they should be active throughout the day. Okay. okay. And, you know, um, I, I, I give a talk. We do, um, we do uh, continuing education and yes. uh, corporate education. Yeah, CME. Uh, yeah. And, and um, one of the, the talks that I um, give um, is about people who are in a workplace setting and how, you know, how to maintain their health in their workplace setting. And one of the slides that I, I um, show on that talks about how people, um, even if you are in a workplace setting and then you work out for three hours every day, uh, fitness training and sedentary activity are independent variables. So Christ. what, so they work independent of one another, right? Yeah. So being active throughout the day, making sure that your blood glucose level is low, your insulin mm. level is low. Um, both of those things are beneficial, not only to your health in general, but not only to your metabolic health, but also to your joint health, because all of, Did not know that. all of the, um, both high, high blood, high blood glucose or glycemia and high mm -hmm. insulin levels, insulin, insulinemia, both of those things are, are detrimental to, to mm. a number of systems in your body, including your musculoskeletal systems in your joint. So we want people to be, um, uh, not only, not just to be active, but to be active throughout the day doing the day. all that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so those are kind of broad stroke things. Yeah. Now, when it comes specifically to, um, exercise, I think it's very important for people, uh, as I mentioned previously, to do functional exercise. Um, so uh, this is exercise that that mimics or is similar to things that they do throughout the day. Mm. Um, and, and then on top of that, uh, people need to be very mindful of their movement uh, and the exercise that they do. And um, they need to recognize that with our joints, we have a range of motion. Each joint has an established range of motion. That that mm. was that's just a function of the type of joint that it is. Yeah. So when we exercise, it's very important for us to um, utilize that whole range of motion. And then we want to. Um, it's also very important, as I mentioned, for people to have uh, lean muscle mass, particularly so in the age group that you're talking about. Mm. Uh, and. and Lean muscle mass is an indicator of health. So we want to make sure that we maintain our lean muscle mass and we mm. maintain our strength around each particular joint. So when we're working out or we're training, um, we talk about training flexibility, which is sort of mm. passive range of motion. We talk about training strength. And then we talk about training mobility, which is the expression of strength throughout the range of motion. So we want people to use, um, to do exercises that uh, utilize the whole range of motion. And we want them to, um, to develop strength throughout those whole mm. range of motion. Um, and then we also want people to uh, train balance because one of the things that is uh, important as we get older, um, we, we want to avoid falling and, and mm -hmm. injuring ourselves, breaking hips and those, those type of yeah. things. So, yeah. so it's important for uh, them to train proprioception. And finally, the last thing is that, um, I hear women, especially women, but I hear lots of people saying this, but especially women let's, um, saying all the time, oh, I don't want to get jacked. I'm, I'm not going to lift weights because uh, I don't want to get jacked. <laughs> and and it, people who say that clearly have never trained with weights because they don't understand how difficult <laughs> it is to get jacked. And weightlifters, that's why they take like performance yeah. enhancing and think, weights. Yeah. Because it it's like it takes so much work, but yeah. resistance uh, exercise um, is is crucially important as well to joint health. Uh, to it's important to uh, bone density, but it's yes. also important to, to joint health as well. And I and I constantly say with my patients, everybody should lift all the time. Everybody. Oh, period. Okay. 
everybody should be lifting weights. Everybody should be in the weight room. All so, right. so those are um, some of the, the simple things that people can do um, to, you know, uh, prevent uh, osteoarthritis or even in the face of osteoarthritis, delay its uh, or slow its progression. Hmm. Interesting. So I guess when it gets really bad, that's when you now have to start thinking about surgery. Is that the case? Is that what ends up happening? Correct. So um, I, I often say to my to patients that I see that are referred to me, um, it ha it should be bothering you on more days than not. Okay. It should hurt more days or more. It should hurt for more time during the week than it doesn't. Okay. And it should preclude you from doing the things mm. that are important or, or necessary for you to do in life, whether that be mm. your work or your leisure or whatever, it, it should hinder you more often than not. Okay. And, and then you can, and then you make the choice, but it is, I always also tell people that selective surgery, man, it, it's like the, the X, I don't treat x-rays. I don't treat imaging. I teach, I treat the patient. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how I describe it to them is this, we are in, I, I have an amusement park and the amusement park has the total hip ride and <laughs> the, the total knee replacement ride on it. Mm -hmm. And so the arthritis is your admission to the park. Right? Okay. So you can walk around. I'm, if you want to go over to the food court, have a hot dog with your family. If you want to just go watch the, the, the animals, fireworks, zoo, yeah. <laughs> watch the fireworks, go ahead and do that. It's up to you to decide mm. when to take the ride, right? I'm just here. The guy <laughs> going, yes, you are above the certain height. You have the appropriate <laughs> age limit. Yes. But now you have to decide when is the right time. To yeah. Do Interesting. So tell me when they do, when they make that decision, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this surgery. What are some of the questions they should be asking their surgeon? Because I think that's one of the things I've noticed. Sometimes people are ill prepared for, and they, they don't even know what to say or what to ask. And they feel that they're going in blindly. I mm -hmm. see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'd like for us to talk about. Well, um, so in, in general, for joint replacements, um, I won't distinguish between hips or knees for, yeah. for this part mm -hmm. of the question. Yeah. I'll just say uh, some of the things that they should be asking about, like I, patients are always asking, well, have you done this before? How many <laughs> have you done? And, and to be honest, most of us um, it, within our general training, yeah. we, we do a ton of arthroplasty mm -hmm. before okay. we are practicing in the okay. yeah. So So I... People can ask that, but I don't think that's important. That's necessary. But, but what I do think is important for people to ask is um, what are the, um, the, what is the surgical approach? Uh, and so mm. it, it's, that's more of an issue for hips than it is for knees. Um, mm. But th they can ask, what is the surgical approach that the, the surgeon uses? Uh, number one. Number two, they should ask, uh, what are the implants that will, that we will be mm. using? Um, and, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, yeah. um, in, in North America, so I'm in Canada, you're in the United States, but in North yeah. America, we, the, we, all of our implants are, are generally good. Okay? okay. They all have a long, uh, track, uh, a long track history and, um, they have all undergone, uh, a, a, you know, a large amount of study and mm -hmm. with the amount of implants that we, that we put in, in North America, um, there are, uh, you know, extensive records about, um, the, their history once they have been imp implanted. So mm -hmm. for, from that perspective, people don't really need to worry, but yeah. the standard implant. So say, say, for example, uh, uh in a knee. Mm -hmm. The standard implant in a, in a total knee replacement is a cobalt chrome femoral cap, a titanium oh. tibial base plate, and then a ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, or it's a type of plastic, plastic mm -hmm. spacer, um, mm -hmm. plus or minus uh, a plastic uh, patella. So that's the standard, okay? okay. Now, and, and that's what, probably 75% of the people are going to get. Mm, okay. Um, 
But we have extenuate, we do have um, alternative implants to put in for extenuating circumstances. So for example, if you have an allergy to nickel, then okay. you, you can't really have the cobalt chrome um, components because that will cause an allergic reaction. So mm. in those cases, we will use a, um, a component which has been treated with uh, a ceramic coating uh, uh, and it will be basically what we call ceramicized. And um, th those are referred to uh, for one vendor as oxidium. Um, other, other vendors have other names for it. Yeah. But so you'll have a ceramicized component. Uh, it's, it's more durable, but it's way more expensive. So we try uh, and not okay. to use it very much, but mm. um, that is something else to consider. Another thing also to consider is uh, the standard plastic that they use for uh, knee replacements is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, but you can have uh, polyethylene that has been uh, irradiated in a vacuum. Uh, again, that increases the cost. It, it improves mm. the cross-linking of the plastic. It makes it more durable, but it increases the cost. Um, and then you can have vitamin E treated polyethylene, which again, mm. More expensive, cost. the price is going up, cha-ching. <laughs> yes, makes it more durable, lasts longer. We yeah. are less likely to um, have to replace it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's another option. Um, but as I said, it increases the cost. Now, all of those, so those are the, the different options mm. and we use them for different reasons. So I mentioned one, nickel allergy. I mentioned mm. two, young age we want people to be ideally around the age of 55 when we do a replacement. And that's oh, okay. because um, for most standard knee replacements, they're going to last between 15 to 20 years. And oh. so at the age of 55 it, in North America, the average female lives into her eighties. The average yes. male lives into their late seventies, but at age 55, you'll have to do it once. And then you uh, will probably need to have one revision and if everything goes well with the revision, we don't have to take out the implant. We only have mm -hmm. to take out the plastic spacer. We do a liner exchange and then you close you back up and away you go. And wow. so you have um, one revision and then that lasts you for the end of your life, right? Yeah. But if we have to do them when you're much younger, then uh, number one, you're more active. So it's likely to wear out faster. And then number two, um, the, the implant just is not likely to last as long. So that means that we will probably have to do two revisions. And mm. once you start to get into two revisions, it, the, the likelihood that you're going to have to take the metal out is, is substantially higher. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And anytime we take metal out, some of your bone is coming out with it. Oh, uh, so, that sounds, that so sounds then, painful. <laughs> The, the implant that goes in after has to be more robust because wow. we're taking out some of the bone. So um, these are things as well um, that, that go into it. So, um, but when you are young, we want to try to use some of these implants, even though they're more expensive, we want to use some of these options that last longer mm -hmm. uh, so that we uh, I hopefully only have to do one revision. Um, so, so that's something else people want to think about. Uh, other things that they want to think about or they want to ask about mm -hmm. is what are the surgeon's rules around things like, for example, smoking. So uh, in the community where I live, um, we generally, uh, there, there are four orthopedic surgeons, all of us do joints and, or sorry, um, the, not the community where I live, but the community, the hospital where I work. Yeah, where you work, yeah. Um, there are four surgeons and um, all of us do joint replacements. Now, ideally, if you were, if we're going to do a joint replacement, you shouldn't be smoking. And, and this is because there so are, do you have to stop or you period? Well, so here's the thing. So, um, we ideally, we want people to stop and they should stop for approximately three months. Oh, wow. uh, and, and that's because some of the chemicals inside, uh, the smoke will kill, um, osteoblast cells. So cells that, that produce bone. So they mm -hmm. will, they will slow the production of osteoblastic cells. And, um, this is important because um, some of the components that we use have uh, a surface that is designed for bone to grow onto. Yeah. So if, if the bone can't grow, then you really can't get a good fit. Yeah. And potentially the implant that, it, that we've put in might end up loosening. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, my colleagues 
uh, two of my colleagues refuse to operate on people who smoke. Period. Um, period. However, the community that my hospital services is a very kind of uh, blue collar working class community. There are a lot of factory workers, lots of laborers, and they, a ton of them smoke and they all need hips and knees and whatever. Yeah. So when I first went there, I was like, you smoke, no need for you, no need for you. <laughs> um, but, you know, eventually it just kind of wore on me because yeah. there were so many people that needed so it. So many, yeah. So, so ultimately I, I just say to them, it, it would be ideal if you could, if you could stop or if you could smoke less, um, yeah. but I do it. So there's two of us that will operate. And, the, and then two that, don't. two that don't. <laughs> so that's another question to ask about. Yeah. The third question to ask about is what are uh, the sur surgeon's rules about uh, weight? Um, oh, okay. So studies show us um, that uh, patients who have a BMI over 40 are mm -hmm. going to have a higher incidence of um uh, complications. So that oh, wow. infection, mm. loosening, fracture, cool. periprosthetic mm. fractures, all sorts of things. Um, so we try not to do uh, patients who are heavier than that patient and patients who are, who come to us, we try to get them into programs, bariatric programs and that kind of stuff. First exercise mm. programs, uh, diet programs to help um, decrease Prior their, to the, yeah. their weight. Um, and again, when I first went to this hospital, I was, I was pretty hardcore. And I was like, ah, yeah, no, your BMI is over 40. Uh, and then I kind of was like, oh, there were some people, if they were close and then it was like 41 and now, so now um, I, I've been at that hospital for, for 12 years. I'm, I know that the, the literature says that um, these people have higher risk, but now yeah. again, because of the community that I'm in, um, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to yeah. avoid. And I just now say to the patients, I say, look, it, this is what the literature says about your state. Okay. With your health, your weight. Yeah. You have to understand if you compare yourself to Joe Blow over there, who has a BMI of 25, your risk is higher. If you are comfortable with that, then I will proceed. But okay. you just need to, I, I warn my patients um, mm -hmm. and I do the same thing for smoking, for the BMI. I warn them and I say, look, it, your risk is higher. And if mm. you're comfortable with that proceeding, knowing that your risk, you know, has gone from yeah. single digits to double digits, yeah. then, then that's okay with me, right? You know the risk. Right. Um, so those, those are, are some very important questions that they should ask. Uh, another one is, uh, what are their thoughts on physiotherapy? So mm. as I said to you, um, I, I am the founder of Human 2.0. So we are a rehab fitness facility. Um, I, I um, founded that, uh, that movement and that organization uh, because um, of my background. So my background, I was, I was a varsity football player. I was drafted in, in our nation. So we in the United States, they have the NFL, Canada, we have the CFL. So I was drafted yes. in the CFL. Um, football was a, a, a part of my life for, for a very long time. And then after that, when I finally had to give that up, I was a fitness instructor um, all while I was going through medical school. Oh, wow. Um, so this was, wow. wow. So you were doing all of that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so I did all that at the same time. Um, and, then, and then after that, I coached football with my sons. Uh, and, and, and so fitness has always been a part of my life. Mm. And um, I, I understand the importance of um, spending time in the gym, strengthening, training, um, developing flexibility, all those kinds of things. I understand mm. that. And, and that's why I started Human 2.0. So I am a very strong believer in mm. physiotherapy, exercise yeah. afterwards. And if you want to get a good result, then you need to put in the work. Um, mm. But some of my colleagues, um, they just are like, I'm just gonna put the joint in after that, it, yeah, whatever you, know. you want to do. And, oh, and wow. like, sometimes, you know, I, some, I've had some of their patients come to me afterwards, um, because their knee is stiff or whatever. And, and, you know, they want a second opinion, though. they want another operation. And I'm like, you don't need another operation, man. The x-ray looks good. You just need some work. And, mm. and, and, um, people, um, I have a bit of a reputation in, um, in my community. So the hospital where I work 
is a hundred kilometers away from where I live. Um, wow. And, uh, but I train the, where I live, I train in that city. So I live in the city of Ottawa and I train there yeah. and that's where my business is. But then yeah. I work in Cornwall, which is a hundred yeah. kilometers away. But in both of those communities, I have a bit of a reputation um, because people know um, uh, my feelings about fitness and, and, and they call me like the, the, the physio fitness Nazi because they, they know <laughs> how I feel about rehab. Mm, and, and, yes. I, and, and I am very much, um, in some respects, I'm a softie and, and I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm very easygoing, but in others, I'm not. And, mm. and when it comes to rehab and fitness, it's all tough love, man. And, yeah. and, and this is, you know, part of it is a little bit selfish, but part of it, but most of it is for the patient. So yeah. the selfish part is that as a surgeon, we want good results because good results reflect well on us. Yes. Right? So when I put yes. something in, if, if I've done it and I'm not, I am not, I'm not here to say that every single surgery I've done is stellar. No, that's yeah. not the case, man. Um, and I'm not here to say that every x-ray that I have is perfect because that's not the case. Yeah. But if I have done, a, if I have done my job well, I have good x-rays, the alignment is there. I've, I've checked the range of motion in the in intraoperatively. Yeah. The range of motion is zero to 145 degrees. I know it's there. Yeah. There is no reason when you come back to me in the <laughs> clinic that it should not be that, right? Yes. You put in the work to make that happen. Yes. Right? I give you the um, capacity to achieve a certain thing, but whether or not you achieve it is all up to you, right? right. And so yeah. people know this. And and um, I I push people and I say, look, yeah. man, this, this is going to be hard work. This mm. is going to be uncomfortable. Um, but if you want a great result, then this is what you need to do. And yeah. I, and I, one of the things I often say to patients is this, I say, look, at, if I, if I put up a hundred patients who had knee replacement, right. And I, and I told them, I, I told them to cover up their knees, cover up their scars. Um, and I just told you a lay person to look at them, right. And tell me which person did their physiotherapy to completion and which people did not. Yeah. I said, I said, I, you as a lay person are going to pick out all the same people that I'm going to pick. Right. Because why? Because you're going to see it. See because it. the people who Obvious. did their work are going to be the ones smiling, walking around, bending down, doing everything like normal that they were doing beforehand. Right. Yes. And the people, the people who were not doing their physio, those people are going to have a problem that you will, it will be evident, right? Yeah, it will be, not, it'll obvious. be evident to everybody. Yeah. Right? So it's very important. So you, you need to ask, um, and yeah, so not every physician, although it, it boggles my mind, why? But not every physician feels as strongly as I do. Yeah. And, and um, you, you need to kind of um, ask, and see what their mm. thoughts are about physical therapy and you know for how long you should be doing it yeah what kind of physio and and that's another thing because all physio is not created equal um yeah the um you know physiotherapists that are doing tens ultrasound ifc cupping man get out of here that stuff, is, <laughs> that stuff is voodoo right um it, it will make you feel good but i i'm not in the business of making people feel good right mm. i'm I, like I am, but that's not my goal. My yeah. goal is to make people better, right? To make them functional so yeah. that they can go back, enjoy their life with their loved one, their kids, whatever, right? Yeah. That's my goal, right? And in so doing, they will feel better. But feeling better is not the first step. That's mm. not the goal, right? Yeah. It's a byproduct of the goal. The goal is to be better, better. and then you feel better. Feel better. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Interesting. Wow. All right. So I have another, so those are good questions. So that's good to know, because I think, you know, sometimes when patients are in that position, they're not quite sure what to ask. And depending on the relationship they have with their physician, they might not say anything. And sure. at the other end, you know, they're complaining after it's all done, yes. but they had an opportunity in the beginning to ask the questions, but they really didn't know what to ask. So Th th sure, this is really sure. good. Um, so one of the things I want to ask you about is, um, you know, you hear a lot of people 
go into the chiropractor. What, what is your view on that? Because I've seen you talk a lot about that. Like, <laughs> I, I, I listen, man. I, so I got, I got my phone here, right? And yeah. I, I, I kind of, I just have another t- chiropractic TikTok that I haven't put up yet that I'm going to put up. Um, but so here's the thing. Um, I, I don't have a problem with chiropractors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think the chiropractors serve a role in the um, musculoskeletal care spectrum. Okay. okay. Uh, and, I, and I think it's an important role. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I, there's a few things that I don't agree with. So um, number one, when I look at what chiropractors do, the, the range of what they do, I think is very small in, mm-hmm. in terms of musculoskeletal care. It, the, the range of, of what their skills are applicable to is small. Okay. Mm-hmm. Largely focusing around back mechanical back yes. pain and, and mechanical neck pain. That's kind of the extent. Um, If they have a little bit more training, then maybe some um, kinds of musculoskeletal injuries, but really not so much. Mm -hmm. Um, So their range of of things that they do is small or that they uh, that they are applicable to is small. Um, Then I also think that their their skill set is relatively narrow. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And that I think that their skill set is is relegated to primarily soft tissue procedures. So, you know, if I were to if I were to say what I thought um, to sum up what I thought a chiropractor was, I would say they're a glorified stretcher. Okay, Mm. that that, that's what they are, because Mm. spinal manipulation is not a thing. Okay, Mm. it it, I know they do it and I know that they claim that it does uh, a whole bunch of things. But if you really look at the literature, um, so when you compare spinal manipulation to physiotherapy or even mm. like just movement, uh, mm-hmm. like just movement, not physical therapy, but just mm-hmm. general movement. Yeah. Um, spinal manipulation is no better, which, which mm. means that, which means that it's not necessary. Okay. Mm. It, it, and so if you're going to treat back pain and this thing is not necessary, then why do it? So that, that's one thing. And then number two, you know, they talk about subluxations, even the chiropractic, there are chiropractic um, uh, associations now that recognize that the, the idea of subluxations, which is what spinal manipulations were originally designed for to mm-hmm. treat subluxations of the spine, subluxations as they describe them, that again, that's not a thing. It's not a thing, man. If, if they've been in an anatomy lab, if they've been in an OR, they would recognize it's not a thing. So, mm. so quit talking that foolishness. Um, so once you can get past that, it's like, okay, you want to treat mechanical back pain, treat mechanical neck pain um, with some soft tissue work, go ahead. That's fine. Um, but I, I don't agree with the idea that um, they extend the range mm. of what they treat to other non-back, non-mechanical ah. back pain related things. And as soon as they start talking about, oh, um, this is treating uh, indigestion, is treating allergies, is treating, oh man, shut up. <laughs> I, did, I, I, wanna, I wanna choke somebody because it's like, this is not real. <laughs> and and um, so, so I don't like that. The other thing that I don't like is that um, if, so I have this thing about, uh, chiropractors calling themselves doctor. Um, and, and, and this is the reason, and it's not that I, I don't think that they should not have a pre- professional designation. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. You, you call yourself whatever you want. Um, but don't use doctor. And the reason why is because doctor has, doctor is an established profession, which mm. has rules and regulations. Mm. Um, and not to say that they don't, but they're not quite to the same extent. Right. And, and we have an established research pro- process, right? Mm-hmm. To validate yeah. what we do. Yeah. Um, and there is a certain amount of goodwill that is associated with the term doctor, mm. right? And as soon as people hear doctor, as soon as the lay person hears the term doctor, they think, oh my God, all right, this is somebody I can trust. I can believe in what they're saying, right? <laughs> but chiropractors, I think, benefit mm-hmm. from that goodwill without having to jump through <laughs> all of the hoops and Oops. do the work and yeah. have science that backs up whatever kind of bull crap that they're spouting, right? And I think, no, man, 
no, you, you can't do that. You, you can't ride on our coattails, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if you want to be uh, seen as the same level of professional as us, because they, they say, oh, we do the same. We, do, we take some of the same courses and, and we get the same education. Shut up. No, you don't. Um, it's not to the same, it's not to the same um, level and, and it's not to the same duration. The, the, yeah, I was going to say the length. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you want to, if you want to have those things, no problem, do the research, show the evidence, mm -hmm. have the same level of training that we do. And for the same duration of time, same levels of the same number of fellowships, all of that. And then if you've done all of that, then after that, maybe you can use that term, right? And you but, said, maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Because uh, I still think people should distinguish because again, it's it's a very what they treat is I think is very, it's a very narrow mm -hmm. segment of musculoskeletal care, right? Um, uh, it's funny when I look at my comments, because um, I have a number of videos that are, are critical about chiropractic, people say, yeah. Oh, you know, you guys are butchers and, and these people are just treating stuff, they, they treat all this stuff, um, um, you know, non surgically and holistically. Oh, okay. yeah. And I'm like, Listen, man, you people don't, uh, you, uh, clearly you're not really thinking straight on this because they, you, they treat mechanical back pain, okay? I don't care what the other, mm -hmm. other things that they say that they treat, that's what they yeah. really treat. Yeah. Um, uh, like call, when you, when you are at one o'clock in the morning after you've been in a terrible wreck on the highway and you have an open femur fracture, right? Like who, are you calling the chiropractor? Get out of here, man. You're not calling the chiropractor. If you have osteomyelitis, infection of the bone, are you calling the chiropractor? Mm. You are not. If you have an osteosarcoma, right? You. What is that? What does that mean? That, that is a malignant, a bad malignant tumor of the bone. Oh, wow. If you have an osteosarcoma, you are not calling us chiropractor, right? Like it's just the, the things that they treat are, are very limited. And, and as I said, their skill set is limited. And, and if you, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> But thank you. I'm glad you kind of went into that because, you know, I've seen a few of your TikToks on this and I'm like, let me, I, I have to ask. And so thank you for explaining. And I'm sure the people listening are like, oh, okay. No they got another point of view. So I really appreciate that. But you know what? I just want to thank you for coming on. No you know, problem. giving our audience, you know, something to think about, whether it's they're doing knee replacement surgery, hip replacement surgery, or considering going to the chiropractor or have already been to the chiropractor, you have given us a lot to think about. So, and then you've also told us what to ask if we do decide to have surgery, because I think that's important too, because that helps us, you know, kind of advocate for ourselves when we're able to ask the, you know, right questions, because we can make an informed decision once we know. So really no appreciate problem. it. Thank you so much for coming and no thank problem. you for all of you for listening. I appreciate it. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. If you enjoyed listening to the show, you have to take a look at Flourish, my monthly online community for women in their 50s and beyond. We talk about the important issues affecting women in their 50s and over and provide tools and resources to help you live your best life. Join me by clicking the link Flourish online community in the about me section below. I'd love to have you join me. See you there.